We're going to talk today about the fellowship again. I guess we could call this the fellowship. You said that with me, the fellowship. The fellowship, part two. I want, to, I want to go back to this. This is something that, as I mentioned as I began last week, certain, certain spiritual things, if we're not careful, they can get diluted. They can even get distorted as we, as we live our Christian lives. We can, we can, uh, things can get so diluted that we lose its flavor. We lose its meaning. We lose the rich spirituality of it. And I think fellowship is one of those things. I, in, in, this is my opinion. Maybe you have a different opinion. You're right to that. But in my opinion, fellowship, the word fellowship, the spiritual concept of fellowship through the years has been diluted to mean just, just gathering together in social activities. But my brother and sister, I want to tell you, it is much richer and much broader and much more lovely and much more wonderful than that. I want us to look back briefly in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. I read this whole little chapter last week. Of course, the writer, the, the apostle John, he wrote a gospel, the gospel of John. He wrote three other little, he wrote these three little epistles. He was privileged on the Isle of Patmos to get the great revelation of Jesus Christ, the last prophetic book in the New Testament. And he saw Jesus in all of his glory here. Here in this chapter and in this book, he's talking about the fellowship He's talking about believers. This is really a book about how we can know we're saved. There's different demarcations, different, different qualities that someone has that you can know that you're a child of God. And by the way, that's the most important thing is life, to know that I know God. There's nothing higher, nothing more important than that. I want us to look today at verses verse 6 and 7 of this first chapter here. Here's what it, here's what it reads given by the Spirit of God, if we claim to have fellowship with him, that is with God. Now, there's a claim someone's making. You know, many people can make many claims today. In our modern day, many people are making the most ridiculous claims that are not in reality. Here is a claim. He says that we, if we claim to have fellowship with him, with God, yet walk in the darkness... We lie and we do not live by the truth. Verse 7 is a verse I've always loved. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. To, to me, the rich meaning there is not, not just that he cleansed me when I came to Calvary and came to initial salvation, but there's this cleansing, this work that God does until the day that we, that we meet him. So this morning, we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this message, the words that we have, the scriptures that we'll go to today as we speak about your fellowship, the fellowship that we have with you, but not only the fellowship we have with you, but the fellowship that we have with one another in Jesus name. Amen. The fellowship. As, as I've said, the fellowship, fellowship in scripture, not just social activities, not just gathering to go golfing, fishing or whatever, but fellowship has a deeply spiritual meaning to it. It is, listen, it is fellowship with the God of the universe, but it's also fellowship, really a, a sharing together with all of God's people. You know, this, this individualistic, if I can get that word out, American concept, some of that's good that we're, we're, we take responsibility for our lives, but, but we're not going to heaven alone, amen? We're walking along with an, with an enormous body of people, red and yellow, black and white, every nationality, every language. Revelation 7 says, from every tongue, every kindred are going to be around the throne of God. And all of those people around the throne of God, from all over this world, through all of the millennium, are going to be those who said yes to Jesus Christ, and we're in the fellowship. Come on. Are you in the fellowship today? This amazing fellowship. I was, uh, as I ministered last week, I read this verse quoted this verse, I think, and one of our dear persons came to me in the Tuesday prayer meeting and said, you know, tell me a little more about that verse. And it was this verse in 1 Corinthians 12 in verse 13. Here's what it says. For we were all 
baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. This is a baptism. How many of you reading through your scripture and you come to different baptisms? This is a particular baptism. Now let me just take a moment here and let you know that scripture talks about many baptisms. Some people only know baptism in water. But do you realize there's many baptism the scripture speaks of? There is the baptism in in water. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that means if you have been born again, if you have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, and if you have surrendered your life to Christ, and you are born again according to Scripture, and you have not been baptized in water, then you have missed your first step. You have missed what one called their first obedience. What is the first obedience of someone who's been saved? Now listen, saved is not joining this church. You know, I used to be a part of the Catholic Church. I was a part of the Catholic Church for about 15 years. That's all I knew. I was an altar boy, had the little suit on, you know, little robe on. I would, I would help the priest serve communion. I would help. Uh, sometimes we'd sneak back there and drink the wine after we're a little bit left over. Don't tell anyone. We would... You know, that was all I knew for, for the growing up years of my life. But here's the thing. I knew the church, but I didn't know Jesus. I knew communion, but I didn't know the, the one who we could commune with and have fellowship. I, I was just religious, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And then between fourth and fifth period, come on. Can any good thing come on between fourth and fifth period class? Someone, a girl named Renee, and I'm always grateful for Renee. Renee Hubbard was her name. And Renee was a, was a friend, but she was a saved friend, but I was a lost friend. But she had enough concern for me because my life was going down. I mean, I was Catholic, but I was going down. I was going down for the count. The devil was trying to destroy my life. And she asked me, would you, would you attend my church? Well, to me... I thought, well, I've been in hundreds of church services, maybe thousands of church services in all of those years. That was no big deal. I was just like, sure. And I thought in the back of my mind, maybe there's some cute girls there. I wasn't very spiritual. But I went and got saved. Come on. I went and something, not that day, but the gospel was preached and the Spirit of the Lord began to work in my heart and in my life. And I was truly changed. I was truly born again. Not because of the church, but because of the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ. I met Jesus, and he changed my life. Now listen, quickly. He so changed my life. There was such a radical change in my life. It just, can I use a young term? It just blew my parents away. Because I used to be in the darkness, and all of a sudden I stepped over in the light. And it really just blew my mom and dad away. They thought that something weird had happened to me. But truly, something glorious had happened to me. My name had been written down in heaven. And now I was in the world, but I was no longer of the world. The Holy Spirit came to live in me and give me new life. And it just blew my parents away. They couldn't understand what happened to me. They couldn't understand that I used to do all this stuff. And now I just wanted to stay in my room and read my Bible. I just wanted to go to the church and go to the prayer meeting. This is what Jesus can do. I was changed. And then I was baptized in water because they said, this is the first thing Jesus commanded us to do is to be baptized in water as a testimony. See, we think the altar call is a testimony. No, the altar call is when we come down and meet the Lord. The altar call, the altar is the time when we come and pray. We can lay hands on the sick or when we minister each other or also when a, when a salvation call is given. And we call someone to come and to say, yes, I want to I receive Jesus as my Lord. But the testimony, the first obedience for a Christian is water baptism. Now, in our new building, we're not going to have a baptismal tank, but we're going to have a baptism. It's going to be portable. And we could drive it in the back of a pickup if we want to. Come on. We just baptize all over town. Seriously, we're actually going to have a baptism that's portable, a tank that we can roll out. We could roll it in the foyer. We could do baptisms because it's our first obedience. Here, 
is what Jesus said. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything which I've commanded you. We, we need to be baptized. This is, this is a baptism. A baptism in water as, a, as a, a sign of the death and the burial and the resurrection of that person. And they've been united into the fellowship and they're testifying to the world, I am a follower of Jesus and I have new life in Jesus Christ. What is it? It's your first obedience. First obedience. There's another baptism. There's a, it's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Jesus also talked about this. I mean, you know, if Jesus is talking about this, I want in on it. I want in on it. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says in uh, chapter 1 verse 4, On this occasion while he was eating with them, he gave this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So Jesus thought the baptism in the Holy Spirit was so vital was so important. This is what his, he was, if I could use it this way, he was hammering this teacher home, this teaching home. This is what he was emphasizing. I'm going away. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to raise on the third day. But the Holy Spirit's coming. He's coming in such a powerful way. He's coming in a unique way. What I have called you to do and the, the mission that I've called you on, you cannot do it in your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit. And he says here, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's another baptism. Baptism in water. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's another baptism, and that's baptism in suffering. When the disciples, Peter and John, or, or John and James, they said, Jesus, we want, we want you to, and his mother, they got their mother on it, we want you to do something for us. What is it? We want to sit on your right hand and your left hand in glory. What a humble, humble group of guys. You know, I heard a guy say one time, well, I want to tell you this. Here's what he said. In my humble and accurate opinion. I won't tell you who said it, but anyway. And Jesus said this to them. Can you, can you drink of the cup that I drink? And then he said this, can, this is Mark 10. Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? And they said, yes, we can. You know what he meant? He meant the baptism of suffering. And he told them, he said, yes, you are going to be baptized in this suffering. Yes, you are going to suffer in, your fo- in, in following me in the mission which I've called to you. But to sit on your right hand, in my right hand and left hand, that's not, even, that's not even for me to give. That's another baptism. You know, there's even a mention of a baptism for the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 29, baptism for the dead. Paul talked about this in in light of the resurrection. Some of them were being baptized for the dead. We don't even know what this means, being baptized for the dead. We don't know if it's those that were saved and didn't get a chance to be baptized, so they were baptized in their stead. We don't know if that's they're being baptized so that they can take their place because they died of martyr maybe or died and, and they needed someone to take their place of ministry and they're baptized in their place. We don't know if it means they washed their bodies in preparing for burial or for for resurrection. We don't know what that means, but it mentions baptism for the dead. I'm telling you, there's all these baptisms relating to the things of God. There's baptism in water. There's baptism in Holy Spirit. Thank God. We need that. Come on. I remember when I was baptized as a young man in this mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of suffering, baptism of the dead. But this verse that I've read to you in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is not baptism in water, not baptism of suffering or for the dead, etc. But it is what happens, listen, it's what happens to an individual when they come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's an incredible spiritual operation that takes place. We are taken by the Spirit of God out of the darkness and we're brought into the light of Jesus Christ. And what happens is we're united to this fellowship. We've all been made to drink of one spirit. We've all been baptized into one body. That means we are in a family fellowship today. Amen. We are in a, we are in a close family fellowship today. And it happens the moment somebody comes into fellowship with God and fellowship with other believers in really a, a, a deep and almost a mysterious fellowship that we share in this life together. Holy Spirit lives on the side of each of every one of us. 
Now look at me today. Just meditate on that just a minute. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in every Christian in this place. Do you realize we're closer than blood kin? We are spiritually connected together in this wonderful, mysterious body of Christ. It's just so, it's so incredible. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. So here's, here's what I'm driving home. Here's what I'm driving home about this fellowship. And I felt Holy Spirit just, just really not letting me let go of this this week. Here's what I'm driving home today is this, that our fellowship together with God and one another is not simply earthly activities, but it is our fellowship that is a deep union with God in Christ and a union with other believers as we participate in all the blessings of this wonderful and amazing gospel. How could we dilute this to just hanging out together? Let's go watch a movie together. Let's go fishing together. You can do all those things. Nothing wrong with those if you want to do those. But that's not Christian fellowship. Fellowship is a spiritual thing that we do when we fellowship with God. We fellowship with one another. We are participating in this awesome body of Christ. So here's a question. And the question is this. Are you having fellowship? Let's look at the fellowship a minute. Let's, let's look at some of the qualities of the fellowship. Are we having fellowship? Are you, are you having fellowship? Are you engaging in the fellowship? It's, it's more than just, yes, what we're doing today is having fellowship. What we're doing right now is we're fellowshipping in his word. We're fellowshipping in worship. We're sharing together in the words of Christ. We're, we're eating the bread this morning. We're partaking of the bread and some of you desperately need this bread this week. You've been bombarded. You, you need a voice of hope. You need a voice of strength. You need a voice of conviction. You've been, the world's bombarded you. You've had a tough time at work. You, you've had stresses in your life. And what this fellowship does can lift every load. Are we having the fellowship? Are you having fellowship? And I would just say yes. Yes, if. Now, this is how we, this is how we know for if we're positively activating, activated in our fellowship with the, body of Christ, with the Lord and with the body of Christ. Let me just say a few things here. First of all, yes, you are participating in the fellowship. If you, if you, or you want to hear this, if you are participating in the mission of the church... You, you can claim to have fellowship. Many false claims out there, as I've read in that text, 1 John 1, 6. Many false claims. You may think you're having fellowship, but you're not really having fellowship unless you're participating in the mission that God gave the body of Christ. Notice, now there's a wonderful verse, but I, I don't think we get its richness unless you look at it in context. Paul writes the Philippians and talks about their participation. And notice what he says, Philippians 1, verse 5 and 6. Let's, look, let's, let's back up and read verse 3. Philippians 1, 3 through 6. He said, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. What's Paul talking about here? You have to understand, he's not just talking about an individual person. Oh, the Lord's working in my life. Well, that's great. I pray the Lord's working in all of our individual lives. This is a corporate word here. To every individual in the church, a corporate word that they are to have, they had partnership. The word there is koinonia. That's the word where we get fellowship. The word koinonia is translated 11 different times differently in the New Testament. Sharing, to have partnership, to share together. Here's what Paul is saying to this people. You begin to support the gospel. You began to support my ministry. When I, was with the, when I was with you there, when I was in jail there, you supported me. You prayed for me. And then later on in this book, he said, you so participated in the mission and supported my ministry, the apostle said, that when I, was, when I went away and no other church shared with me, you shared with me. You sent support to me when I needed it so desperately. Here's what this is. Here's the Philippian church, one of the most positive churches in the New Testament. 
Very little negative here. A lot of churches in the New Testament, you got a lot of negative stuff going on. I mean, Corinthian church, I'd like to be the pastor of the Corinthian church. I preached like 39 messages through the Corinthian uh, letter back a year or so ago. 39 messages, and I'm going to tell you, I've got an appreciation for Paul's leadership pastoring that Corinthian church there. But here is the Philippian church, one of the most positive loving, supportive churches. And you know what this church was into? They weren't, now we're going to have a potluck here, so I I ain't again it. Come on, amen. (laughs) But I'm just trying to emphasize a point here. This church wasn't just getting together to have a volleyball game. They weren't just getting together to to have a bingo night. They, they They were together in partnership with the gospel. Yes, we have fellowship. Yes, we can do those fun, natural things. But dear brothers and sisters, we are left on this planet to be about the mission of the gospel, taking the gospel to the whole world. We must be about this mission. You say, I'm in fellowship. Am I in fellowship? Yes, you are. You're participating in the fellowship. If you are participating in the mission of the church, what's the mission? The mission is twofold, really. The mission is really, uh, really, we could boil it down in a nutshell. It's upward and outward. It's upward and outward. When, when Reese and I, when Pastor Reese and I went out, uh, went out this week, we, we, we put flyers on 150 homes, talked to a few people. One lady couldn't speak English. I was like, okay, I'm the pastor of the church. I was like, I'm the pastor of the church. I need an interpreter. I was like, uh, Senorita, I'm the pastor behind the church of the church here. We're building a church behind your neighborhood here. We want to welcome you. We want to greet our neighbors. And she was like, yeah, see, see, yeah. She was like, yeah. I thought she didn't understand a word I said. And then I I shared one flyer with Zacchaeus, a guy up a tree. He was really up a tree. He was on a ladder up a tree. I said, sir, could I place this on your door? He said, sure. I said, I'm the pastor of the church. I said, we're inviting people to church. Just welcome our neighbors. We're building a new, we're building a new facility. We'd love to have you and your family come. Great, great. So here's, we were fulfilling the mission. We're trying to get the good news out. We're trying to get the salt out of the salt shaker. We're participating in the mission of the church. Listen, if your Christian life is just coming to church and leaving and going home and living your life, you're not really participating in the fellowship. This fellowship is everyone's involved in the gospel. You may be praying for the ministers. You may be praying for lost people. You may be going out inviting people, knocking doors. You may be involved in some kind of ministry. But you know what? The fellowship and the partnership is much easier in the mission if we're all doing our part. Come on. So you're, in the, you're participating in the fellowship if you're involved in the mission of the church, the mission of the church. Paul said they started the mission. They partnered with Paul and they said from the first day now, and he says until the completion of that, until the day of Jesus Christ, let's not let the enemy get us off the mission of touching people for Jesus Christ, of winning souls for Christ and the building up and the edification of the body, the discipleship of the believers and the evangelization of lost people. Let's be about that mission. Some of you hadn't witnessed the people in a while. I want to encourage you, participate in the mission. See, there's a fear that many people have of sharing the gospel, but really it's very simple. Just talk to people. Just talk to people. It's very simple. Don't, you, don't have, you don't have to have a three-point sermon. Just talk to people. You talk to people every day. Start like this. Say, hey, I would like to invite you to my church. Maybe that's the level you are. I'd love to, love to have you attend one of our worship services. Or like me, I've got a box of tracks that I hand out. I hand, there's a lady down here at the Wendy's, and I've given a track to her several times. And I know she knows what's coming. I'm, that's a track. The last one I gave her was, um, it, was about, uh, it was about salvation, but I forget the front of it. But I gave that to her, and she's a real friendly lady. And I'm, 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 the gospel is going to get there. Amen. See, this partnership, this fellowship is more than just coming on a Sunday. It's participating in the mission. See, Jesus has a heart for lost people. See, it's almost like we have come to Christ, but if we're not sharing Jesus with others, it's like we, you know, it's like, uh, remember the four lepers in the Old Testament? They, they, the Lord did the miracle. Remember this? The Lord did the miracle. The four lepers did the miracle. And they went in, they were starving, and then the, the Lord gave a great sound, and all the, all the, the army left. And there they walk in, and now they have, the run of the, they have the run of everything. 
They're eating, going from tent to tent. They're even going to hiding things. And then one of those lepers said this, we do not well. You know, because the city, I think it was Samaria, I think, they were starving. They were eating, eating people. Cannibalism. It was so horrible. And here are these lepers. They found food and, and supply. And then one of them said, hey, you know what? We do not well. Because this is the day of good tidings, and, we're, and we haven't told others about it. And I say that to us today in, in, in relationship to partnershiping with the gospel and fellowshipping in the church. If we're participating in the mission of the church, we do not well if we come and worship. We do not well if we enjoy the blessings of the gospel. We do not well if we know this wonderful, beautiful Savior who will wash our sins away and give us eternal life, and we're not sharing it with those who are in the darkness. How don't, why don't we participate in the fellowship by getting involved in the mission of the church? And everyone can do it. Do it the youth ministry, your children's ministry, or seniors' ministry. We can do it everywhere we go. We can do it in our families. Let's participate in the fellowship. Are we participating? Yeah, if, we, if we're involved in the mission of the church. Also, uh, we are in having fellowship if we're participating in the worship of the church. This is also a part of our fellowship. Let me give you a picture of this. And we, I think you just, all of us have had such beautiful fellowship with Jesus this morning. Our songs, I could hear all of you singing as our worship team was leading. We were worshiping. And honoring Jesus and lifting his name up. And you know what we're doing? We're having fellowship as we worship together. Worship is something our nation is losing. We're losing worship. Because we're losing the home. We're losing the home. The home is just being shattered in our nation. We need to, we need to fight for the home but we need to fight for Sunday worship as well. When I was a little boy, I remember nothing was open on Sunday. I'd ride my bike down in Montgomery, Alabama, where I grew up, and I would ride my bike at the shopping center on Sundays. And I knew I could ride my bike down there because if I rode in the, in the day during the week, the, the people would come, get off this sidewalk, you get to kill somebody, kid. But on Sundays, I could ride through those things. And, 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 and then I remember, as a, and it was so striking to me, you know, maybe because God was calling me to the ministry one day, but it was so striking to me. All of a sudden, everything started opening up. And I remember it so vividly, and I thought it was so strange how everything was open up on Sunday. Like it was, Sunday was like a Monday. But you know, for God's people that put Jesus first, Sunday is a very important day. I realize we can worship Tuesday, Wednesday, every day is we can dedicate to the Lord, but there's something about Sunday. You know why? Because that's the day of the resurrection. That's the day Jesus came out of the grave. That's the day he conquered death, hell, and the grave. My Jesus came out, and he's risen today. He's risen. So every Sunday morning, we are saying to the world, Jesus is alive. He's risen, and he's alive in this body. And we're fellowshipping you for participating in the worship. Here's a, here's a good worship service here. Here's what it says, Acts 13, very quickly. Acts 13, verse 1, it says, In the church at Antioch, by the way, Antioch, one of the greatest churches in the history of the world, Antioch. If you could pray for anything, say, Lord, give us an Antioch revival. What happened in Antioch was amazing. But here in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Serene, Manaean, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now here's the worship service. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, uh, King James says they were ministering to the Lord. I mean, I just see them. They're in a worship service. And they're having fellowship together with one another and with the Lord. And they're worshiping. And probably some of them are praying in the Spirit and worshiping in, in a prayer language or singing, singing a psalm or a hymn or a spiritual song. And they're worshiping and they're singing and they're blessing the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God moves on one of the men, one of the prophets. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So when they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And we get a, a communication from God in the middle of the worship service, in the middle of the prayer meeting, in the middle of the fellowship as they're participating in worship. They're, they're engaged in worship. 
I mean, you know, we could be better engaged in worship. I saw actually quickly, and I'm, I'm done. I saw uh, another video of, a, of in, in Ukraine, and this was Sunday, I guess, was yesterday for them. So, and they're worshiping, and it was, it was I could tell it was a spirit-filled church. I mean, they're dancing, the whole bunch of them, old, young, everybody's dancing. The, the worship leader's dancing. The old people are dancing. The young people are dancing. This was like yesterday. They're worshiping in the face of this little tyrant. And they're worshiping as, as the Russian troops are coming in and they're dancing and they're praising. What are they doing? They're participating in fellowship as they're worshiping the Lord our God. Hallelujah. The fellowship. Are we fellowshipping? Yeah, if we're participating in the mission, participating in the worship. And I'll just give you one more as our musicians are coming in. We're gonna, we want to have a specific prayer time here today. And, and that is, yes, we're, we're involved in the fellowship if, if we are participating in the life of the church. Participating in the life of the church. And I'll read you one more little portion. This is in Acts 2, 42. We get a, in, in the very primitive New Testament church, the, the, the early on as the Spirit of God has fallen, the, they, the, the Spirit of God, as Jesus prophesied, not many days you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You're going to be endued with power from on high. And they had a prayer meeting for 10 days. For 10 days, it was just solid prayer meeting. I'm sure people were coming and going, but, but there was somebody praying for those 10 days, and they were worshiping and waiting in the presence of God. All of a sudden, the wind began to blow, and they could hear the wind. They could see fire come in a, in a spiritual fire, light up on each of the people. And the, and the Spirit of God came on them, and the Bible says, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And it was a supernatural move of God. But how many understand there's got to be something after that? I guess we would say it this way, if I could bring it this way. What happens after the altar call? What happens after I've experienced the power of God? What happens after I was filled with the Holy Spirit? There has to be a spirit-filled, not just a spirit-filled moment, but a spirit-filled life that we walk out as we fellowship in the body of Christ. Because this is a spiritual fellowship. And look what happens after the power of God moved. The days after. Here's what it said. Acts 2.42. And we're done. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. To the fellowship. To the breaking of bread and to prayers. Everyone was filled with awe and wonders as miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone who had need, as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the fellowship. These were believers that had been been to, uh, they had experienced the 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where they'd all been baptized in the one body, all been made to drink of one spirit. They'd been united to the body of Christ. They'd experienced the power of God. Then they had this beautiful life together. They, they shared their money together. They prayed for those who were sick. They worshiped together. They shared the apostles' teachings together. They were committed to one another. Listen, and here's my plea today. My plea is this. In a world that's so fragmented, in a world that's so unkind and so hard and so unloving and so callous, let us see God build a fellowship with here of love, a fellowship of care, a fellowship of mercy, a fellowship of ministry where we're participating in the gospel, but we're also participating in the lives of God's people. It's the fellowship. You, you see, you see what I'm see what I'm getting at. When you still use fellowship, you're more than at a fishing hole or on a golf course. You're fellowshipping. If you're fellowshipping in prayer, you're fellowshipping in witness and evangelism and the word of God and giving toward the gospel. It is a deeply spiritual thing. We're fellowshipping with the God of the universe who has saved us through His Son Jesus, and we're fellowshipping and participating in the lives of all of those who have like precious faith.
get the salt out of the salt shaker. We're participating in the mission of the church. Listen, if your Christian life is just coming to church and leaving and going home and living your life, you're not really participating in the fellowship. This fellowship is everyone's involved in the gospel. You may be praying for the ministers. You may be praying for lost people. You may be going out inviting people, knocking doors. You may be involved in some kind of ministry. But you know what? The fellowship and the partnership is much easier in the mission if we're all doing our part. Come on. So you're, in the, you're participating in the fellowship if you're involved in the mission of the church, the mission of the church. Paul said they started the mission. They partnered with Paul, and they said from the first day now, and he says until the completion of that, until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's not let the enemy get us off the mission of touching people for Jesus Christ, of winning souls for Christ, and the building up and the edification of the body, the discipleship of the believers, and the evangelization of lost people. Let's be about that mission. Some of you hadn't witnessed the people in a while. I want to encourage you, participate in the mission. See, there's a fear that many people have of sharing the gospel, but really it's very simple. Just talk to people. Just talk to people. It's very simple. Don't, you, don't have, you don't have to have a three-point sermon. Just talk to people. You talk to people every day. Start like this. Say, hey, I would like to invite you to my church. Maybe that's the level you are. I'd love to, love to have you attend one of our worship services. Or like me, I've got a box of tracks that I hand out. I hand, there's a lady down here at the Wendy's, and I've given a track to her several times. And I know she knows what's coming. I mean, that's a track. The last one I gave her was, um, it, was about, uh, it was about salvation. but I forget the front of it, but I gave that to her. And she's a real friendly lady. And I'm, 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 the gospel is going to get there. Amen. See, this partnership, this fellowship is more than just coming on a Sunday. It's participating in the mission. See, Jesus has a heart for lost people. See, it's almost like we have come to Christ, but if we're not sharing Jesus with others, it's like we, you know, it's like, uh, remember the four lepers in the Old Testament? They, they, the Lord did the miracle. Remember this? The Lord did the miracle. The four lepers did the miracle. And they went in, they were starving, and then the, the Lord gave a great sound, and all the, all the, the army left. And there they walk in, and now they have, the run of the, they have the run of everything. They're eating, going from tent to tent. They're even going to hiding things. And then one of those lepers said this, we do not well. You know, because the city, I think it was Samaria, I think, they were starving. They were eating, eating people. Cannibalism. It was so horrible. And here are these lepers. They've found food and, and supply. And then one of them said, hey, you know what? We do not well because this is the day of good tidings and, we're, and we haven't told others about it. And I say that to us today in, in, in relationship to partnershiping with the gospel and fellowshipping in the church. If we're participating in the mission of the church, we do not well if we come and worship. We do not well if we enjoy the blessings of the gospel. We do not well if we know this wonderful, beautiful Savior who will wash our sins away and give us eternal life, and we're not sharing it with those who are in the darkness. How don't, why don't we participate in the fellowship by getting involved in the mission of the church? And everyone can do it. Do it the youth ministry, your children's ministry, your seniors ministry. We can do it everywhere we go. We can do it in our families. Let's participate in the fellowship. Are we participating? Yeah, if, we, if we're involved in the mission of the church. Also, uh, we are in having fellowship if we're participating in the worship of the church. This is also a part of our fellowship. Let me give you a picture of this. And we, I think you just, all of us have had such beautiful fellowship with Jesus this morning. Our songs, I could hear all of you singing as our worship team was leading. We were worshiping. And honoring Jesus and lifting his name up. And you know what we're doing? We're having fellowship Amen. as we worship together. Worship is something our nation is losing. We're losing worship. Because we're losing the home. We're losing the home. The home is just being shattered in our nation. We need to, we need to fight for the home but we need to fight for Sunday worship as well. When I was a little boy, I remember nothing was open on Sunday. I'd ride my bike down in Montgomery, Alabama, where I grew up, and I would ride my bike at the shopping center on Sundays. And I knew I could ride my bike down there because if I rode in the, in the day during the week, the, the people would come, get off this sidewalk, you get to kill somebody, kid. 
But on Sundays, I could ride through those things. And, 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 and then I remember, as a, and it was so striking to me, you know, maybe because God was calling me to the ministry one day, but it was so striking to me. All of a sudden, everything started opening up. And I remember it so vividly, and I thought it was so strange how everything was open up on Sunday. Like it was, Sunday was like a Monday. But you know, for God's people that put Jesus first, Sunday is a very important day. I realize we can worship Tuesday, Wednesday, every day is we can dedicate to the Lord, but there's something about Sunday. You know why? Because that's the day of the resurrection. That's the day Jesus came out of the grave. That's the day he conquered death, hell, and the grave. My Jesus came out and he's risen today. He's risen. So every Sunday morning we are saying to the world, Jesus is alive. He's risen and he's alive in this body. And we're fellowshipping you for participating in the worship. Here's a, here's a good worship service here. Here's what it says. Acts 13. Very quickly. Acts 13. Verse 1. It says, in the church at Antioch. By the way, Antioch, one of the greatest churches in the history of the world. Antioch. If you could pray for anything, say, Lord, give us an Antioch revival. What happened in Antioch was amazing. But here in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now here's the worship service. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, uh, King James says they were ministering to the Lord. I mean, I just see them. They're in a worship service. And they're having fellowship together with one another and with the Lord. And they're worshiping. And probably some of them are praying in the Spirit and worshiping in, in a prayer language or singing, singing a psalm or a hymn or a spiritual song. And they're worshiping and they're singing and they're blessing the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God moves on one of the men, one of the prophets. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So when they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And we get a, a communication from God in the middle of the worship service, in the middle of the prayer meeting, in the middle of the fellowship as they're participating in worship. They're, they're engaged in worship. I mean, you know, we could be better engaged in worship. I saw, actually, quickly, and I'm, I'm done. I saw... Uh, Another video of, of in, in Ukraine, and this was Sunday, I guess, was yesterday for them. So, and they're worshiping, and it was, it was I could tell it was a spirit-filled church. I mean, they're dancing, the whole bunch of them, old, young, everybody's dancing. The, the worship leader's dancing, the old people are dancing, the young people are dancing. This was like yesterday. They're worshiping in the face of this little tyrant and they're worshiping as, as the Russian troops are coming in and they're dancing and they're praising. What are they doing? They're participating in fellowship as they're worshiping the Lord our God. Hallelujah. The fellowship. Are we fellowshipping? Yeah, for participating in the mission, participating in the worship. And I'll just give you one more as our musicians are coming and we're gonna, we want to have a specific prayer time here today. And, and that is, yes, we're, we're involved in the fellowship if, if we are participating in the life of the church. Participating in the life of the church. And I'll read you one more little portion. This is in Acts 2, 42. We get a, in, in the very primitive New Testament church, the the. the Early on, as the Spirit of God has fallen, the, they, the, the Spirit of God, as Jesus prophesied, not many days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You're going to be endued with power from on high. And they had a prayer meeting for 10 days. For 10 days, it was just solid prayer meeting. I'm sure people were coming and going, but, but there was somebody praying for those 10 days, and they were worshiping and waiting in the presence of God. All of a sudden, the wind began to blow and they could hear the wind. They could see fire come in a, in a spiritual fire, light up on each of the people. And the, and the Spirit of God came on them. And the Bible says, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. 
And it was a supernatural move of God. But how many understand there's got to be something after that? I guess we would say it this way, if I could bring it this way. What happens after the altar call? What happens after I've experienced the power of God? What happens after I was filled with the Holy Spirit? There has to be a spirit-filled, not just a spirit-filled moment, but a spirit-filled life that we walk out as we fellowship in the body of Christ. Because this is a spiritual fellowship. And look what happens after the power of God moved. The days after, here's what it said, Acts 2.42, and we're done. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Everyone was filled with awe and wonders as miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone who had need, as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the fellowship. These were believers that had been, been to, uh, they had experienced the 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where they'd all been baptized in the one body, all been made to drink of one spirit. They'd been united to the body of Christ. They'd experienced the power of God. Then they had this beautiful life together. They, they shared their money together. They prayed for those who were sick. They worshiped together. They shared the apostles' teachings together. They were committed to one another. Listen, and here's my plea today. My plea is this. In a world that's so fragmented, in a world that's so unkind and so hard and so unloving and so callous, let us see God build a fellowship with here of love, a fellowship of care, a fellowship of mercy, a fellowship of ministry where we're participating in the gospel, but we're also participating in the lives of God's people. It's the fellowship. You, you see, you see what I'm see what I'm getting at. When you still use fellowship, you're more than at a fishing hole or on a golf course. You're fellowshipping. You're fellowshipping in prayer. You're fellowshipping in witness and evangelism and the word of God and giving toward the gospel. It is a deeply spiritual thing. We're fellowshipping with the God of the universe who has saved us through His Son Jesus, and we're fellowshipping and participating in the lives of all of those who have like precious faith. I want you to stand with me today. I want you right there where you are, pray. How, how does this message apply to you? How, how, what changes do you need to make to be in the fellowship, to be participating fully and actively in the fellowship? Are you engaged in the mission of the church? Are you engaged in the life of the church? Are you engaged in the things of God within the church? Are you using your gifts, talents, and abilities which the Holy Spirit has gifted you with to minister to others and to help build the body and to lift up Jesus? Let's, let's just pray together. You pray right there. Oh God, we want to see this fellowship become richer and more wonderful. We pray, oh God, for an anointing to be poured out on your people, that all of us would sense the call of God to participation, to participate in this fellowship. Lord, there's so many beautiful children of God in this room. They have gifts, talents, and abilities. They feel the tug of your spirit. They, Lord, you've anointed them, and they see the world from a, from a very unique vantage point because that's how you've called them some care for children some have a call to evangelism some have a call to youth others have a call to prayer ministry others have prophetic ministry or other gifts healings but lord you've anointed all of us and we want to make a difference in the body now, church, if you want to make a difference in this body, I want you just to lift both hands and say, Lord, I want to do whatever you want me to do in this body right now. Lord, I want, I want to be a part of this fellowship. I want to do everything you want me to do. I surrender. I'll do whatever you want me to do, Lord. If you want me to preach or pray or serve or give, Lord, I want to participate in the mission that you've given the church. We surrender to you. We lift our hands, that universal sign of surrender. Use these hands. Use us, oh God. Use us to bring glory to Christ. We worship your great name. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. 
Blessed be your great and wonderful name. Now let me just tell you something. The Lord heard that prayer. If you pray that from your heart, if you pray that sincerely from your heart, Jesus heard your prayer, and he's going to take you up on it, I promise you. He wants to use you in a positive way to build. See, all the gifts of the Spirit are to build. None of the gifts tear down, amen? None of the gifts tear down. None of the vocal gifts tear down. None of the power gifts tear down. None of the serving gifts tear down. They all build. Because that, that means this, that you are a difference maker. You young people here are a difference maker. Brother Reese and I have been praying about the, the youth ministry, and God's given us some, some good directions, and so we'll share that with you later. But Brother Reese and Matt.